Welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture, guaranteed to spice up your relationship with God. I'm your host, Stephanie Roussel, and here is today's episode. So Oz, it is wonderful to welcome you today on the Gospel Spice podcast. Well, real pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Stephanie. I am particularly excited about this time together because I have read your last book, The Magna Carta of Humanity, and I have to say, my copy of it is pretty tattered. It's marked all over the place, it's highlighted, it's dog-eared, because I think that the message of that book is extremely relevant. And what I'm hoping we're going to do today is give some of the highlights of what you are talking about in the book, which I think is a real challenge to Western civilization as a whole, which is, you're tackling major topics there, and to our generation, especially living in the US today. Interestingly, this conversation is gonna be a British gentleman and a French girl talking about America, and that should be interesting. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Being French, um, I have to start by asking you what your, understanding is of the French Revolution and 1789 and how you contrast it so powerfully with 1776. Can you tell us how you're viewing these? Well, the French Revolution is one of the great decisive events of the modern world. Now, if we look at the five major modern revolutions, the English, the American, the French, the Russian, and the Chinese, I was there at the last one, the French is the first of the great anti-Christian, anti-religious revolutions. Both the English and the American actually came out of the Reformation. So they're different because the English failed and the Americans succeeded, but they're both Christian or pro-Christian because they came out of the Reformation. But the French Revolution is a volcanic reaction against the Christian faith, the Christian church, and religion in general. Mm -hmm. That's a very brief summary. So tell us a little bit more, and maybe using your own example, you said you were in China uh, in 1949. So how do you link that to the consequences or the the children of the French Revolution 200 years later? Well, let let me say a little bit more about the differences. Mm -hmm. You know, when I say the French Revolution. I'm not talking about France today. Thank you. (laughs) Because as you know well, you know well as a French woman, the revolution only lasted 10 years in France. And then Napoleon came along and said, the revolution is over. And it was replaced by a dictatorship. But while it didn't last in France, there were outbreaks in 1830, 1848, and so on. But more importantly, Like a huge volcanic explosion, the lava flows from the French Revolution have really flowed out ever since. In the 19th century, the most important was revolutionary nationalism in France itself, Italy, Greece, and so on. In the 20th century, although designed in the 19th, it was revolutionary socialism, in one word, communism. But Interestingly, in our own time, and many people don't realize it's linked, we're facing revolutionary liberationism or cultural Marxism. And that's what's profoundly affecting the United States and other Western countries. So the French Revolution lived, although it didn't last very long in France itself. Now, when you look at the differences though, they begin with a difference in their sources. The American Revolution, largely, sadly not consistently, but largely out of the Bible, and above all the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. The French Revolution, out of the French Enlightenment, the work of Diderot and Voltaire and uh, people like that, Rousseau, of course, too. So they begin with different sources, and then they have a huge number of differences all down the line. One of the most important is the realism of the American Revolution and the utopianism of the French Revolution. Mm 
based, of course, on a biblical view of humanity. So the American Revolution has at its heart the separation of powers, which goes back to Exodus. You have what the Jews call the three crowns of government, the monarchy, the priesthood, and the prophets. And they're different, and they all had different power. And of course, in America, you have the executive and, the, and, and so on. But that's based on the potential for the abuse of power and a realistic biblical view because of sin. Whereas the French Revolution, you think of Rousseau's idea, man is born free everywhere in chains. So you remove a chain or two and we'll all be happy, free and fulfilled. Nonsense. So you can see in their sources and their realism or lack of it, they're profoundly different. And those differences go all down the line. Mm -hmm. So everything is rooted in this deep human desire for freedom. But as you're explaining uh, Exodus, the vision of the American Revolution rooted in Exodus, the book of Exodus in scripture is the book of the liberation and the process of liberation of the Israelites out of Egypt. And then what it means to live out this freedom. And you, you make that difference very clear between liberation and freedom. And in the same way that that's the human heart, we want to be free. Um, the French Revolution was meant to set the French free. And even today, by the way, in French schools, we are being taught that it did set us free. And just because you're British, I have to say that when we lived in the UK, it was fascinating to hear Napoleon uh, treated as a tyrant. Whereas in France, up until recently, he was really viewed as a hero up to up until my generation in, in our textbooks. So it's very interesting. It's fascinating to watch how history <laughs> is being explained differently. Uh, uh, you know, on both sides of uh, of the shores of France and England, depending on, on who's telling the story. But I agree with you. I completely agree with you that the French Revolution um, was rooted in humanism. And any attempt to change the system that is rooted in humanism cannot succeed because of human sin and because it's utopian at heart. As you were saying, we see it in, in Russia. We see it in China. We see it in America today. So if we can bring this towards the American shores right now, can you help us understand um, a little bit more of how America was founded? Not how the textbooks might be telling my 17 year old daughter in school today, because there's a lot of revisionism maybe that is happening, but how do you see America being founded? Um, what was the definition of freedom rooted in more in detail? And then what is happening today in America? Well, there are many things that America received almost directly from the Bible through the Reformation. You could say a whole number of them are down in terms of the limits to power because of the danger of the abuse of power. But I think the principal contribution is the notion of covenant. And many Americans don't realize that the U.S. Constitution, the notion of Constitution, is actually a national somewhat secularized form of Jewish covenant. Now, if you look at the different styles of government and the way societies are founded, as the historians say, some are organic. They're just linked by blood and kinship, like an African tribe or a Scottish clan. There aren't many like that in the modern world. Most of the governments in history were what's called hierarchical. They were linked by power, kingdoms, empires, Egypt, Babylon, Rome, you name it. Now, when you have governments linked by power, force, conquest, you have the problem of the abuse of power. And it was actually a Catholic layman who made the famous remark that all power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, the church, the early church, copied Rome. Rome had the Caesar, the consuls, the senators, and then the church copied it, and you had the pope, the cardinals, and the bishops. And that became corrupted. Think of the Inquisition. Think of the dreadful notion that error has no rights. So the Reformation said that wasn't biblical. You go back to the Bible, 
and the Exodus is covenantal. Now, what's covenantal? It's, a, it's, it's government built on a common binding agreement. So one striking feature is you have freely chosen consent. That's the origin of the English-speaking idea of the consent of the governed. So three times it says in Exodus, the Lord proposes the covenant. Three times it says, all that the Lord says, we will do. One scholar calls that an almost democracy, freely chosen consent. And that's just the beginning of this notion of covenant. Another notion is the reciprocal responsibility of everyone for everyone. You know, you take your three musketeers later in the 17th century, all for one, one for all. Now, the Jews had that thousands of years earlier, and they say every Jew responsible for every Jew. You love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, there's a collective responsibility, a solidarity. The Americans say, we the people, and so on. So you see, all of that comes from the Jewish notion of covenant. Now, it's an incredible idea because it gives birth to freedom. But there's a snag. It depends on people keeping their promise. And as you can see in the Bible, and as we know in history, the Lord keeps his word always. But we don't. And that's why covenantal or constitutional governments break down. Because humans don't keep their word. Mm -hmm. Okay, you touched on so many things. And I'm already both very frustrated because I have there's so many conversations we could be having. Um, and so we're going to try to keep some of the highlights. And I really uh, encourage the audience to read the book. Um, in it, at the very beginning, you explain, um, I'm a Bible geek. So I love, you know, when you tie everything back to scripture. And this is what your book and what you do in general, uh, your, your, your message is always deeply rooted in scripture. And what you do is that you extract the biblical message and you apply it to our generation in, in a way that is absolutely extraordinary. I think it really is God's spirit that is allowing you to do that. And I'm very grateful for it. But in, in the book early on, you explain those three encounters that God has in Exodus with the people of Israel and how it, you know, we, it starts at the burning bush. It's, he's an encounter with one man. And then it's, it continues uh, in Exodus 6 uh, with an elite group of people. And then what you're referring to Exodus 19, which is the birth of the covenant between the entirety of the people, the one and only time in history where God meets with an entire nation at once and they enter into this covenant of agreement with the Lord. That is the basis of uh, 1776 and the American Constitution, as you are saying. We fe it feels like we have moved very, very far away from it. What I want to do is read um, from your book what you, the, the four or five lines that you write at the end of each chapter. It's a message that you keep repeating at the end of each chapter, and you're proving your point, and then you're providing solutions for it. So I'm going to read it. And I'd like you to unpack a little bit um, how we got to needing to hear what I'm about to read. So at the end of each chapter, you say, America cannot endure permanently half 1776 and half 1789. The compromises, contradictions, hypocrisies, inequities, and evils have built up unaddressed. The grapes of wrath have ripened again, and the choice before America is plain. Either America goes forward best by going back first, or America is about to reap a future in which the worst will once again be the corruption of the best. Now, that's a loaded statement. Uh, can you unpack at least the beginning of it for now? How did America end up one foot in 1776 and one foot in 1789 today? Well, let me, many of your audience, I imagine, are followers of Jesus. Let me go back to something that Christians know well. You know, when the Apostle Paul writes to the early church in Galatia, he says, who's bewitched you? You're following another gospel. You came to faith in Jesus through a gospel of 
grace and freedom, and now you're following a gospel of works and legalism. Who's bewitched you? You switched from one gospel to another. And what I'm saying to Americans, in essence, is who's bewitched you? You switch from one revolution to another very different revolution. Now, it's no secret that America is divided. Everyone talks, I live in Washington, the great polarization, the endless divisions, incredible divisions in America. But why? Some people say it's the coastals, California, New York, against the heartlanders in the Midwest and the South. Some people say it's the populists, you know, Hillary Clinton's deplorables, over against the globalists. There are all sorts of reasons that people give, but I think the deepest reason is this shift from ideas that come from the American Revolution, originally from the Bible, switching to ideas that have come from the French Revolution. So if you take ideas like postmodernism, political correctness, the cancel culture, critical race theory, the sexual revolution, tribal politics, identity, go on down the line. All of those ideas, which people know well, they come from ideas which flowed down, not from the American Revolution, but the French Revolution. And they've overtaken so much of American life. Now, the book I try and analyze how that happened. It's not classical Marxism, communism. It's cultural Marxism. And it goes back to a gentleman called Antonio Gramsci, an Italian. He sat in jail under Mussolini as a Marxist. He actually died in jail. But he tried to figure out why Marx was wrong. Revolution didn't happen the way Marx said. And he switched the whole Marxist thinking from economics and politics to culture and politics. His idea, you've got to win the cultural gatekeepers, the people who are astride the doorways of influence and power, and then you can win everyone in the world beyond the door. His ideas were picked up by the Frankfurt School, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And in America, they were very much influenced by Herbert Marcuse at the University of San Diego in California. And at the end of the 60s, 68, he and Rudi Deutschke, a German radical, called for a long march through the institutions. In other words, put simply, you wouldn't win in the streets. You had to win the colleges, the universities. You had to win the press and the media. You had to win what they called the culture industry, Hollywood and entertainment. Win all those areas, then you could sweep around and win the whole culture. So today we see all these things like speech codes and cancel culture and all that stuff, but it comes from that long march through the institutions. So you see much of America today, above all, the intelligentsia, the intellectuals, they've been taken over by ideas from the French Revolution, <laughs> not the American. Now, <laughs> Stephanie, you know well as a French woman, Monsieur Macron actually warned the French of being affected by ideas from American universities. That, that actually <laughs> blows my mind. I was in France this summer. So, uh, you know, just to, to bring it back to at a much lower, my tiny little personal level, when I came to the US 30 years ago for the first time, America was a very different place. I was a different person. So I, I didn't have the same understanding. Maybe I have that, um, you know, old years can bring, but um, it was, it's been fascinating in a negative way to watch the evolution of America over the last 30 years. And again, as a French woman and you know, as a Brit, like there's, I'm seeing this fascination by Americans for all things European. And it grieves me to no end because I see what um, this mindset has done to my country and to my people. And I don't want it to happen in America because of the, because exactly of what you're describing. Um, to some extent, so I was in France this summer and exactly this conversation of 
my, my French uh, friends were asking me what is happening in America today. It's like America has gone further and beyond where France has ever been. And it's not exactly that. I mean, the, 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 um, the, the boundary lines, the, the fault lines are slightly different. But the idea of pushing it to the extremes, I always joke uh, that whatever, whatever Americans choose to do, they do it extremely well and they do it extremely. Uh, Americans are known for going after their goals big time. We used to joke that in soccer, uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Americans had no idea what football, what you and I would call football was. Um, they named it soccer and they decided to go after it. Now, Americans are really good soccer players and it's probably likely they will become some of the best soccer players very quickly because they invest heavily and they never play. They, they just, they play to win. In the same way, ideologically, they're not taking half measures. And when I see them embracing the European notions uh, that you are summarizing as 1789, I find it terrifying. Um, the difference, I think, is that France has been dealing with these ideas for those 10 years, then maybe there was a bit of a inoculation or vaccination. Uh, this is a dangerous word to use these days, but this idea of we got to see the negative effects of the revolution. And so maybe it kind of inoculated us against going full on behind those ideas, but the Americans have not. And so actually you have a quote in your book. Um, that is what, what you're saying here. And I'm, I'm going to quote you here. The land of the free is now the Western nation most vulnerable to ideology, fanaticism, and authoritarianism. Yep. Authoritarianism. That's mm -hmm. one of those tongue twisters for me, French girl. Why is America more at risk of the dangers of 1789 than Europe has ever been? Well, you know, Stephanie, that the greatest commentator on America was a Frenchman, Alessie de Tocqueville. Tocqueville, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the second greatest was an Englishman called James Bryce. He's not so well known. Mm -hmm. But he made some very interesting comments around 1900. He was Queen Victoria's ambassador to America. And he says in Excellence, a very long book, he says, Europeans always have two things that hold it together. Your tradition and you have social cohesion because people live in small towns and small villages and still do. So even if religion collapses, he says, you still hold things together somewhat. But America, he says, doesn't have that. America's free, mobile, strung out, cars, planes, people moving, you know, the American phrase, move on, move on, time to move on. And Bryce says only one thing holds America together, unlike Europe, and that's, and this is in 1900, religion which is obviously the Christian faith in 1900. But then he says, if religion, the Christian faith, were ever to weaken and decline, nothing would hold America together. And you would have what he calls the completest revolution. And that's what we're seeing today. So Americans do go to extremes. And you can see an unraveling, an erosion, a fraying, because there's an erosion of the bonds that are holding America together. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that is a very dangerous place to be. And your book, you know, again, we could go deeply into how that happened and uh, the ideological currents that are uh, impregnating the culture so much and into the schools. And when my kids come home and we have to have these conversations because they get for the lack of a better word, honestly, to be honest, and maybe a little blunt, they get brainwashed into a particular vision of history in particular that I find very dangerous because I don't think it's accurate. Uh, there's a revisionism that is happening. There is a uh, an indoctrination. The long march through the institutions is, is coming full bloom uh, with the next generation. So um, if we can start switching gears towards uh, maybe what you were explaining about the covenant model uh, could you help, you know, the 
the audience uh, were primarily, you know, average Americans, you and I are not, but uh, most of the audience are Westerners, or actually, even if they're not, they're probably looking at America today, scratching their heads and wondering what is happening in America. So could you help the audience maybe start um, touching some of the ways that they can tackle this at their level? I mean, they are, you know, any one person is not, unless it's a Josiah that we are praying to, maybe the Lord will rise up uh, in America today. That's one of the things that is missing maybe today is a modern day, you say Lincoln in your book or Josiah in, in Judah. But what would you tell an American listener uh, who is listening and maybe a parent who has a couple kids in school or someone who is trying to live out their faith and is seeing all of these contradictions What's one or two things that they can start doing um, to, to live up to their beliefs and to live up to 1776 in a country that is moving to 1789? Well, the challenge you can see is that reciprocal responsibility of everyone for everyone. So mm -hmm. in a monarchy, I'm actually Irish in background, not British, but in a monarchy, every subject is subject to the king or the queen and so the king or queen are responsible but not in a republic like america every american is responsible just as it says every jew is responsible for every jew now how on earth do we do that well the jews put it very simply we are all responsible some are guilty or to put it another way we are responsible for those things that we could have done, but didn't do when we could have done. Mm -hmm. Now, we got to think of that. In other words, we start with our calling. God has given us all unique gifts in a unique sphere at a unique level in society, America, wherever it is. We're not responsible for the whole thing. We're responsible for our spheres of influence. So we all have a family. We all have a community we live in. We all have a workplace we work in most of the week. And then for some doctors, say, or writers or politicians or whatever it is, our spheres, your podcast, they go wider than our immediate circles. So it's a challenge for everyone to think through what actually is the sphere of their influence and their calling. And to say, Lord, how can I be responsible to stand up and to speak out in my sphere. So, yes, there's a collective responsibility of everyone in America responsible for America. But we only do that within the spheres, and we're only guilty if we could have stood up and prevented something, and we didn't. And that's the challenge. You think of the Germans. You know, they didn't stand up in time. You remember the famous quotation by Martin Nemo, the pastor, you know, they came for the trade unionists, and I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I was a Christian. Then they came for the Catholics, and I was a Protestant. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to stand up. In other words, we're not responsible for the whole thing, but just for our spheres, and above all for places we could have done something, prevented something, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. you you yes it's um ju just that is is um begs the question uh, how then shall we live uh and you point again i think in your book about at the uh the uniquely jewish answer rooted in exodus uh, rooted in Moses, rooted in his last words to his people that had to do with the transmission of this legacy as opposed to sheer just communication. Can you talk to us about the role of uh, the transmission of this information? Schools, uh, Moses' call to his people to listen uh, to the words of the Lord. Well, that's a very important idea and it, one where there is a direct parallel between the U.S., and the Jews. Now, there are areas that aren't. For example, in the Jewish covenant, the Lord was a partner. The Lord isn't a partner in the American constitution, although the early Americans understood they were 
fulfilling the constitution, quote, under God. He wasn't a partner, but it was under him. That's different, of course, in the, in the Hebrew constitution, at the heart of everything, they're learning to live freely together with each other. And at the heart of it is the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle. And that's a key part. We don't have that. We have voluntary privilege of going to our churches, but it's not the same as the tabernacle for Israel. But you're raising a point where there is a direct parallel. I love the fact that as the rabbis say, what did Moses talk about the night of the Passover? 430 years of slavery, and they're going free. He never mentions freedom. They're going to the promised land, the land the Lord had promised them again and again from Abraham onwards. Milk and honey, he never mentions it. What does he talk about? Three times Moses talks about children. In other words, the story we tell to our children is the key to one, identity, who we are, and two, continuity, how we pass it on from generation to generation. And you can see that's the critical thing, that handing on, that transmission. Now, both freedom and faith need to be handed on. And if ever you don't hand it on, they collapse. And you can see that both faith and freedom, differently, have a problem in America. They're not being handed on. Now, with freedom, it's a problem in the public schools. They used to have what's called civic education, teaching American history, teaching what made Americans American. It collapsed after the 60s, the Long March. Think of that. But the same, sadly, is often taken part in the church. The old idea used to be what they called catechism. Now, you don't need to use the word, but the idea is broken down. Now, it should start in families, and it should be in schools. But if the family transmission and the school's transmission breaks down, well, both faith and freedom are in trouble. And that's what's happening in America. You look at, say, generation what we call in England Z, what you call Generation Z, they have a very poor view of faith and a very poor view of freedom. It's not that they're completely different. It's just they haven't had freedom and faith handed on to them. Mm -hmm. All right, let, let's go there. Um, why is America, the land of the free, uh, having a crisis of freedom how has America turned freedom into an idol, and how, why is that extremely dangerous? Well, I didn't mention this in the book, but it's an odd thing that the word freedom doesn't come in Exodus, where it comes later in some of the laws. Obviously, the idea of freedom is there, let my people go, and so on. But the word freedom is never used, not once. And people have puzzled over that. And one of the answers given is probably that the biblical realism again, because freedom is only a means. It's not an end. It's a means. Mm -hmm. If I am free, I have the means, the ability, the capacity to do whatever it is, to be myself, to speak what I want to say, and you the same, and so on. So freedom is an ability, a capacity, a means. But the trouble is, it's so wonderful that we turn it into an end and an idol, and then we make it something that we pursue for itself. So, for example, the big difference in freedom, you can see this in Lord Acton, who's the greatest historian of freedom. He says, freedom is not the permission to do what you like. It's the power to do what you ought. As soon as freedom becomes an end, we do whatever we like. Or as modern people say, as long as you don't harm someone else. But do what you like. No, no, the Bible says. You need truth and character and a way of life to live freely. We know that health means eating well. Well, the same thing is true of freedom. Freedom means living well in the limits of truth and character and a way of life that supports freedom. So freedom is a dangerous idea, and I've got 
both my books, the idea there's a paradox of freedom. The greatest enemy of freedom is freedom, if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, because as, as you explained so clearly, freedom, uh, the human heart will go towards the extremes of freedom, either uh, totalitarianism or anarchy or chaos. It's very hard to find that balance of what is true freedom for me and for you, um, and you make a case powerfully that um, our freedom is rooted ultimately in the freedom of God. So can you tell us a little bit uh, theologically, what do you mean by the freedom of God? And, and I love your image of how God restricts his freedom. Uh, and that's inspired, by the way, by this rabbi that you are quoting uh, at length throughout the book who inspired you, Rabbi Sachs, who um, explains, I think, I think it's him, that um, the freedom of God, he self limits his freedom uh, to honor our free will. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, think in a wider way first. A lot of people take freedom for granted. We're modern people, surely it's all about freedom. But in fact, most of the world doesn't believe there's a foundation or a grounding for freedom. Obviously, the Egyptians didn't, the Babylonians didn't, it was in their stars. The Greeks didn't, it was a matter of fate or fortune. But what's remarkable is that modern atheism and modern secularism doesn't believe in freedom either. Everything's a matter of determinism. Chance and necessity, as they say, it might be our genes, it might be our uh, cultural background, whatever, but we're all genetically or some other form determined. The Bible is unique in addressing humans as capable of freedom choose life, and so on. So that's wonderful. Now, it's obviously rooted in creation. God alone is sovereign. In other words, he exercises his will despite any interference or opposition from anyone. He is sovereign. We're not sovereign, but we are significant. And we can choose, and we can be creative, and we can grow, and we can be transformed. And of course, the biblical ways to show us how. But then you made that incredibly important point. The final freedom, the heart of freedom, is the freedom of the heart. Mm -hmm. So you take the political rights, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. None of those touch the heart. And the heart is where it starts. And as you said, and the Jews say, the Lord does not invade the heart. And so you see in that great passage in Deuteronomy, Moses says, I put before you the blessing and the curse. I put before you life and death. Choose life. But then you have the little words in the middle. If your heart leads you astray, the best and the worst all begin in the heart. And, of course, that's a very Christian thing, evangelical thing to think of. You think of uh, Revelation 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You think of Holman Hunts, the pre-Raphaelite painter, his great painting of Jesus knocking at the door, no handle on the outside. Why? As the Jews say, God will never invade our freedom in the heart. You know, Roger Williams, who was the one of the first great champions of religious freedom and the founder of the state of Rhode Island, he, he used the word, very strong word, God does not rape our conscience. He's made us free, able to choose, and God respects our choice, which is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. I, the way I say it is that God is shy. He will not force himself on us and he almost asks us permission to uh, to start this relationship. And I've seen it in my own life, how he led me to himself by a challenge to taste and see that he is good, which is why even to this day, this ministry is called Gospel Spice, because it's about tasting and seeing that the Lord is good because he will not force himself on us. Um, actually, it's fascinating listening to you. I'm making a connection that I had never made. My favorite verse uh, in all of scripture is Philippians 3.10, when Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and 
the fellowship in his sufferings. And we're all about, you know, the power of the resurrection, maybe not so much the fellowship in the sufferings, but listening to you, I'm realizing this also speaks of the freedom of God and the fellowship of his suffering in the sense that he is choosing to limit his own freedom in order that we can enjoy the power of our own freedom. And so when we are knowing God, when we know Christ, we are, have we develop in him this ability to uh, exercise the power of our own freedom, but also to limit our freedom just like he does. Um, I think you quote one of the rabbis uh, in your book saying how, if God is everywhere, how can there be a room for anything else unless God willingly chooses to withdraw himself from some parts of his creation so that anything else can exist, in particular, the human heart. And so um, that takes me, the reason why Philippians 3.10 is my favorite verse is because in French, we have two words for the English word to know, to know Christ. And uh, there's the, the head knowledge, savoir, which is you have in English, you know, savoir faire, mm -hmm. to know how, which is the historical knowledge of the facts. It's super important to know your history, as you well know. But that is historical knowledge. It's a word you find in the Old Testament, in the Chronicles, in, in Samuel, uh, in, in Proverbs. It's about the head knowledge of, even of wisdom, um, is a form of head knowledge. And that's very, very, very important. And that word in French, of the thousand times or so that the word to know is in English in the Bible, there's about 300 times that it is the French word savoir, which is primarily, again, in the Old Testament. But then you've got another French word, which is the actually from the Greek gnosko that actually gave your English to know, K-N-O-W, and that's connaître. And that is heart knowledge. It's experiential knowledge. It's, mm -hmm. um, it, it is not the facts. It's that experience. It's that tasting. It's like, well, if you've never really had good chocolate... I can describe it to you for hours, but until you actually take a bite, you will never know, connaître, experiential knowledge of chocolate. You might, just like there are theologians that are atheists, right? They have a lot of savoir, they just don't have connaître. They don't have that experiential knowledge of God. That is that word that is found uh, in the Psalms, that is found in Paul. 95% of the time, Paul uses the English word to know. It's the French connaître because it's that experiential knowledge. So it comes mm. out of this to say, it's about knowing God. And when we bring this conversation back to the idea of covenant, uh, which is a, um, a limitation of my own freedom in order to do what I ought and not what I want necessarily, this idea of freedom, uh, it is rooted deeply in knowing God. I think that is that is where, as Christians, we have uh, a calling, we have a duty to do what we ought, as you're saying, in our families, in our communities, in our circles of influence, because us, we are the ones who know God. The rest of the world doesn't, but we claim to know him. We claim to want to live in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And so it has to start with us. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> Um, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling here a little bit. But, no, that was, uh, very, that was very profound. I would add to that. We've talked about the Exodus, that moment of freedom. As the Jews point out, by the later times of the prophets, Hosea and others, the Exodus becomes the marriage ceremony, the covenant, and then it leads to God's marriage with his people and the supreme expression of love and the Hebrew word yada, like your word connaître, is Hosea and the Song of Songs. Now, that's absolutely remarkable. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And to, uh, yes, and Adam knew Eve, that knew in French is connaître, not savoir. Again, because it's that intimate knowledge that the Lord invites us into. And it's absolutely mind blowing that the Lord of the universe would invite us, his creation, to enter into intimate relationship with him at that level of connaître, not just savoir. And mm. that is revealed, uh, you know, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God revealed in the face of Christ Jesus. Again, Paul is, is deeply into that intimate knowing of Christ as the key to, to be who we are, to, to become who he, 
uh, who God created us to be. Freedom is to is this ability to to know who we are called to be, and then the ability to actually become it by his spirit. Uh, it's fascinating that you're bringing up Hosea because I had a question for you and I don't know, that might be completely um, out of left field and absolutely irrelevant. I am currently in my personal Bible reading. Uh, I'm reading Jeremiah, which is not easy. Uh, and I am reading Jeremiah with your book in the back of my mind. And so I'm making connections that I don't know that they need to be made. So I'm just humbly asking you to, to help me discern um, I'm seeing, and again, this is just me talking, and if it's completely wrong, I might even not leave it in the recording, you know, uh, or maybe I will, because it's very, very good to acknowledge that, you know, we, we, we might be reading things wrongly. Um, when you read Jeremiah, you have this very clear picture that God, you know, and it's linked to Hosea, which is uh, the divorce with Israel in some ways because of their behavior. Um, and then Jeremiah is kind of telling Judah, hey guys, you know, this is going to happen to you because you are following in the footsteps of Israel. Look what happened to Israel, the 10 tribes of the north that were invaded by the Assyrians. And and you guys in Judah, like you have had good kings. If you look at the, at the genealogies of the king, every single Israelite king was bad. Eight out of the 26 or so Judean kings were good. Josiah being the most famous. Uh, there were some really bad ones too. Um, and that brought them a bit more uh, time under their covenant with God, about 150 years more. But eventually, Jeremiah is saying, this is coming to an end because you are following in the footsteps of your older sister Israel. And just, you know, the imagery is one of prostitution, just like Israel prostituted herself with false gods, so are you doing, and you will reap the same consequences. And, and Jeremiah is weeping, um, trying to, to tell his people, do not walk in the footsteps of Israel. So it makes me wonder, is America walking in the footsteps of Europe? And therefore, are we, are Americans about to reap the same consequences as Europeans are, which is complete secularism, um, e even more, even more, the, just like Israel ended up being appalled at how Judah was treated, uh, will Europe one day potentially be appalled at the way America is, is behaving? And, and again, my conversations with my French friends this summer tended to indicate that the French don't understand uh, how far the Americans are going. So does that make any sense to compare Israel and Judah to Europe and America in some ways? No, of course. Absolutely, of course. And that's why in Israel, apostasy is viewed as adultery. Mm -hmm. Now, if we looked at the West, the West owes a lot to the Greeks, to philosophy, science, democracy, the arts, owes a lot to the Romans, for example, governance, but the major roots of the West are Christian. And above all, the way that Europe was won by the gospel and became Christendom. And Europe has been dominant, the West has been dominant for 500 years, mainly Europe and then the super Europe, America and the English speaking world, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and so on. But we are now towards the end. So Europe, and the West is what's called a cut flower civilization. Cut the roots of a flower and put them in a vase. They'll look beautiful for a short while, but they'll die. And that's where we are in the West. Western civilization, unless there's a profound restoration, renewal, renaissance, call it what you like, Western civilization is in decline. And now sadly, America, is rapidly showing signs of the same things too. So we've got to say with sadness, we're in a time very similar to the prophet Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So um, do we need a Josiah? How could that happen? How do you- Well, absolutely. That? You know, as I said earlier, the Jewish covenant depended on everyone agreeing. But the trouble is the Lord kept his word, the people didn't, which meant that you needed renewal. Now they had means of regular renewal. You know, every seven years, the king was called to read the Torah publicly to the nation. Mm 
And then, of course, you had the annual celebrations like the Passover and so on. But when you had times of real breakdown, say Ezra and Nehemiah, you had to have leadership. Then you had to return the people and rededicate the whole nation to the Lord's purposes again. And I have said, and I've come in a book that I'm writing now, it could be on some July the 4th. We need a leader with the courage and the stature of a Lincoln who will call America back to the best of the American Revolution and maybe, Hebrew style, on some July the 4th, have a national rededication on the mall in Washington and call the nation back. Now, the nation is far gone. You can see the radical left among others and the secularists among the liberals would dig in their heels and refuse to come back. So it's an open question as to whether it might happen. But some leader has to call America back to its best, to a restoration and a rededication to the first principles of what once made America great. I've often said, you know, the former president talked to make America great again. And the current president, for better or worse, talks about restoring the soul of America. But neither of them talk about what made America great in the first place. And that's what matters. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like Jeremiah sometimes? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm, no, 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 <laughs> no. But a, does it feel wait. like it? Does it feel like you are trying to tell the people to like, you're trying to like take them by the shoulders and shake them and tell them to wake up because you don't realize what is happening. And um, so it's because I see how, you know, I see the, the dual in some ways, actually, that's a question. Uh, would you say that maybe some of the dual purpose of what you're writing this latest book but you know by and large your entire message is about um equipping the by and large the christians and and the people who wish to have a positive influence uh to go back towards uh the sinai uh, magna carta you know as, as you as you describe it or um so so equipping the, the the everyday people to to wake up and then to do what they can in their communities but also finding that needle in the haystack of that leader who will uh, be the, the figurehead to lead the country in a direction dramatically different from today. Well, so, you know, if I identify with anyone, it's sometimes Ezekiel who complains to the Lord, Lord, I'm a singer of fine songs. And the trouble is you go around many, many places and you're just part of an entertainment program and you're one more speaker and next week they'll have someone else and they thank you and they're warm and if you say something nice about America, they love it, but they don't do anything. That's mm -hmm. my real complaint. But think of you, Stephanie, as a French woman and me as an Irish uh, in background. I meet many people who come from the Czech Republic or Russia or China or whatever. All of us who've seen the effects of some of these ideas elsewhere, Eastern Europe, for example, we cannot believe that America would fall for these things. So mm -hmm. in the book, as you know, I tell a story. I was in the Chinese revolution as a seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. And many, many years later, when I was at Oxford in my 30s, I met Sir Isaiah Berlin. And it turned out over dinner, he'd been a seven-year-old in the Russian revolution. And I'd been a seven-year-old in the Chinese revolution. And as we compared notes, we thanked the Lord for the English-speaking people standing against, say, Hitler. But then at that stage in the early 70s, mid 70s, we would never have believed that America would fall for a version of Marxism, cultural Marxism. It would have been unthinkable then. But if you come from China or Russia or Eastern Europe or you from Europe and, and so on, we know enough to be horrified at the way Americans their eyes are closed. They're not thinking. And sadly, they're going to wake up one day and it may be too late. Mm -hmm. That is a sobering thought, to, to say the least. And um, I can see how... Uh, I, I'm sorry that you feel like Ezekiel. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yeah. I, I hear it. And But you see, the beauty is you are living what you are challenging us to do. You're living it out, which is 
this is your calling. You, you were called to talk in your community and to share what the Lord has laid on your heart, just like Jeremiah did and Ezekiel and Isaiah and all of them. And whether it is received or not, that's not up to you. You have done what the Lord has called you to do. Actually, there's another French word. Uh, I don't know if you have the equivalent in English. Um, the French is Jeremiah, Jeremiah, which is Jerem Jeremiah. No, Jeremiah. Oh, there you go. Does that exist in English? English? Word. No. There you go. See, I didn't that, know that word in English. That actually came from America because not from France. The French copied it because in America, there was literally a man every year who was called to give a critique of where the community stood in a negative way. And it was called the annual Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, of course, people became so optimistic and self-confident and doing it themselves, it dropped out of fashion. I mean, who would, no one likes today <laughs> to be called a Jeremiah. <laughs> Correct. Well, see, my, my uh, um, growing up, what I was told about the French word, Jeremiah, is that it is out of the Bible because Jeremiah keeps on complaining. And, you know, when you're secular, you don't see what he's trying to do. You see him just yeah. complaining and warning and scaring people off. And, and the Jeremiah in, in French is when you just scare people up and you're whining and complaining all the time and you're just a crybaby. Actually, that's kind of what it means to the point that this first name, Jeremiah, is very much out of fashion in France because who wants to be uh, related to that guy, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so back to back to the conversation. What I'm loving you, uh, you, what I'm hearing you say, what I love is that, again, back to knowing God, uh, this idea of freedom um, fails or succeeds based on our understanding of the freedom of God, which means it's based on our knowledge and back to knowing God. Um, and, and the breakdown of trust with God, which is the breakdown of faith, uh, really is the reason why America is, is falling at the seams right now and why Europe fell at the seams in the Enlightenment is that breakdown of trust in the identity of God in who God is. And so I know for me as a former atheist coming to faith, it has been a journey of um, learning to trust God because I understand more and more because he reveals himself as who he is. So essentially it boils down to who God is and our hunger or desire to experience, to know, to uh, both head knowledge and heart knowledge, to know who he is. And that's where I think um, I love the partnership uh, that even you and I have right now at this uh, at the level of this little podcast, because there is this, um, I think as believers, we have two feet that we need to be firmly grounded uh, with. One is to be rooted in the identity of God, who he is. Uh, and that means we study scripture, we uh, meet with the fellowship of believers, we um you know, we, we deepen our understanding or knowledge or hunger of him. And that's what we aim to do here on the Gospel Spice podcast is that we, mm -hmm. we love to come alongside people by teaching scripture in order to highlight who God is and, and make you fall in love with him more and trust him more. And then on the other side, the other foot would be this awareness um, and those keys to understand the world that we live in which is what you're doing, because what you're doing is that you're taking scripture, you're taking this solid grounding in Exodus, in Sinai, in this case, in, in this book, and then you're explaining, you're extrapolating how it applies to us today. And therefore, it's this ping pong between who God is and the world we live in and how who God is informs how we live in the world that we live in. And in the same way, how this world that is bent that is badly bent out of shape how we as believers are this force to turn the world uh i think you use the expression right side up again um is that correct well i love that idea it's another jewish idea biblical idea god creates order you think mm -hmm. of creation and sin humans through sin create disorder so God works into a disordered, sin-ridden world to turn it the right way up. So when he turns it upside down, it's actually turning it the right way up. So you have in Acts 17, the agitators attack Paul, and they say, these men 
who've turned the world upside down have come here. In other words, revolutionaries. But properly understood, a Jewish and Christian revolution is not turning the world upside down the wrong way, like the radical left. It's turning the world upside down the right way. And so one of the, I often tell the story, at Yorktown, Americans forget this, when the British and the Hessian troops surrendered, they were ordered to play the musical tune, The World Turned Upside Down. Now that ballad, that music, came from the 17th century, the English Revolution, and the idea was freedom is the man who turns the world upside down. And that was a biblical idea. And so Christians are the true, Jews and Christians are the true revolutionaries. Yeah? Now, you have to explain that so we're not just using the term casually as a cliche. Yes, and actually you go as far as saying that God is the first revolutionary Absolutely. once the, fa the fall took place because he does put things right side up. And Jesus ultimately is the greatest revolutionary in that sense and on so many levels, even to the point that he was revolutionary because he was not the revolutionary that people mm. expected him to be. So even in that, he changed things up. Um, can we go to, um, I'd love to link a little bit what, everything that you're saying with uh, what we are currently studying on the Gospel Spice podcast. So as you know, we alternate in-depth Bible teachings with uh, guests that have a fabulous message to share like you today. And so um, right now we are uh, studying the tabernacle. And so the timing is phenomenal because, it, believe it or not, I was not planning it this way. But a few days ago, I realized, oh my goodness, Oz and I are going to talk about Exodus. We are in the middle of Exodus, studying the tabernacle. Uh, so these are two, I mean, the tabernacle and uh, God's covenant with his people uh, are intricately, intricately linked. Can you tell us how you are viewing the role of the message of the tabernacle in light of the Sinai revolution, as you call it? Yeah, well, Exodus itself, getting out of Egypt is a negative. That's the liberation, the greatest political liberation in history from one of the greatest superpowers in history. But that's only the negative side. And freedom is negative freedom from, but it's also positive freedom for. Now, the covenant is the model, the system of how a freed people, a free people, can live together freely and justly. Love your neighbor as yourself and all that. But even that is not the final goal. The final goal is that everyone knows the Lord. And again and again, you can see running back in Egypt and all the way through that they will know that I am the Lord. In other words, that's not just putting down the Egyptians, Pharaoh and so on. It's so that the Israelites who were called to know the Lord could know him for themselves. And so at the heart of the camp, at the heart of the covenant, is the tent of meeting, the place where the presence of God is real. And so, you know, Moses goes out every day and, and so on. And everyone stands at the door of their tents to see what happens because it's so amazing. And I, I love the fact, you know, Moses, under these incredible crises, the most daring prayer in the Bible is when he prays, Lord, show me your glory. Mm -hmm. In other words, he knows that nothing less than the reality of God will see him through this incredibly difficult task of leading the people to the promised land. And he's almost blown it several times. And he doesn't make it in the end. And he says, Lord, I want to know everything about you that a fallen human being can know and still live. So he doesn't see the Lord face to face. But the Lord covers him and then pronounces his name, what the Jews call the 13 attributes of mercy, which you have in Exodus 34. But that's at the heart, the tent of presence, God present with his people. Now for us far better, our Lord taking flesh, tabernacling, among us. And so we know God through Jesus far more 
intimately than the Jews knew God through the tent of presence. But the tabernacle is the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Not just getting out of Egypt and not just having a good political system to live by, but all that in order to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're back in that theme of, of knowing and um, the, the, the Hebrew word for presence and for face are one and the same, right? So um, the presence, when, when Moses was in the presence of God, it's literally he was in the face of God. Um, they were face to face, presence to presence. And, and same thing, you know, again, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face, in the presence mm -hmm. of Christ Jesus. So that idea of intimacy. Um, but I'd add something there too, going back to what you said earlier, Stephanie. You know, the Jews say the greatest Christian slander of the Jews is that the Christian faith is all about love and Judaism is about law. And they say, no, not at all. Listen to the Shema, listen to Israel. It called to love the Lord your God. And obedience and trust are love. Faith is love. And knowing God is love. And as we said earlier, in terms of Hosea, you know, in the Song of Songs, the, even C.S. Lewis may have been wrong at this point because his, his idea that love is you know, putting someone's best before them and so on. The Jews say, no, no. You read the Song of Songs, the heart of love, and that's all about the Lord and faith. Mm -hmm. The heart of it is passionate and actually erotic. Mm -hmm. And that's the Hebrew notion of love as faith and faith as love. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Actually, one of my dreams one day is to, is to teach a series on the Song of Songs, but that I might need a bit more courage to get there. But yes, absolutely. Um, you're saying back to Exodus, because actually Exodus is that, um, how can I say, I, I think maybe that God is, is teaching his people uh, for the first time after, after slavery, uh, what it is like to be in relationship with him. And um, I don't think this is a perfect quote from your book because I've taken notes and one of the notes I have, so it's probably a paraphrase of something you say, is that um, Exodus is about a free God freeing his people to worship him freely, which is true love, um, and to build a free society, which is love your neighbor as yourself, and the society that is worthy um, of his freedom as being ultimately sovereignly freedom and their freedom as his creatures perfectly love. So it all really, freedom and love um, in a biblical sense really go so much hand in hand that they are some of the essential attributes of God. And that's what we're called to know as believers. Absolutely. You put it well, I did say that. Um, that's why it's well put because I'm quoting you. <laughs> No, no, that, that's, I think, deeply, which is why today followers of Jesus should be the champions and defenders of a rich, deep human view of freedom. Amen. One implication is it's time for Christians to get off the back foot. Mm -hmm. You know, so many American Christians are discouraged, demoralized, defensive, and rather fearful and sometimes alarmist and prone to believing conspiracy theories and that sort of nonsense. But if we're in touch with the Lord, you think of the biblical view of human dignity or the power of truth or the importance of words mm -hmm. and then the, the richness of freedom and the power of justice. We have the answers to all these great issues in our world today. And we should be moving out with incredible confidence because we know that the alternatives are bankrupt. And the scriptures as a whole, and the gospel in particular, gives us incredible answers. So off the back foot and move out with courage. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the challenge of our generation, as it is the challenge of every generation, uh, to, to stand on those two feet of knowing God through a, a deep, biblical knowledge and i think by and large I, I do see a lukewarmness in the western church today that that 
uh, saddens me. And uh, I do feel this, this calling to, to rekindle this passion for God. And again, that's why we're called gospel spice, because we bring this spice back, this fire, this passion back, uh, which, you know, you can link to all of those notions that we discussed of freedom, of love, of knowing uh, that deep tasting and seeing this deep intimacy. I mean, when you taste something, that's a pretty intimate experience. And that's what God is calling us to. And so having this deep, intimate experience of knowing the Lord, which is so transformational that then when you understand and you use that grid of your uh, biblical understanding to apprehend and understand the world that we are living in, you you cannot but be a force of for transformation, uh, which is what you are challenging us to do once again. So I love the... Uh, the, the intertwining, the weaving of those two feet um, in order to, to be that force for the world. Um, so, Oz, I really could go on for a long time, but I think uh, we need to wrap things up a little bit. Could you maybe, as, as, we, um, as we wrap up, tell us a little bit more about... Um, this idea of covenant, again, you've touched on it, and I know it's where your book is leading. The second half of the book really describes how a covenantal agreement, uh, Exodus style, Exodus 19 style, is the solution. But how can individuals actually carry out this covenant when there isn't a nationwide covenant happening right now? So what can individuals do right now to enact the Exodus 19 covenant with the Lord? Well, we have to think where we all are. So in families, obviously covenants are the deepest, richest basis of marriage. And the same should be true of a church. And in other words, everywhere we have a chance to affect things, the, the notion of covenant brings in freedom, consent, and responsibility, and all these things to the max, which no other system does. But we can only do what we can within the spheres that we have. And that's where we've got to start. But I'm also trying to get Christians to think in a big picture way. Here we are in this civilizational moment. After 500 years, not very long, but quite a long time, 500 years of Western dominance, mainly inspired by Christian ideas, the West is in decline. And America's in decline. The scandal of the American church, this is the one Western country where Christians are still a huge majority, bigger than any other community. Take, say, our Jewish friends, 2% of America. Or people we disagree with, say, like gays, 2% of America. We're huge, but we're uninfluential. We're not being salty or light-bearing. So it's time for us to examine ourselves in the light of Scripture and the light of the Lord, repent when we haven't been where we should be, put things right, and go out and play a key part in our world. Because what a time. We're on the verge of what's called singularity in a transhuman future. But we've got to see with these titanic questions, God is greater than all. So the Lord can be trusted in every situation. So we should have no fear, have faith in God, just fulfill our little callings and play our part and leave the outcome to our Lord. What an incredible moment, but we must each do our part. And as the Jews point out, we're responsible above all where we could have done something, we could have prevented something and we didn't. So let's make sure where we can, we do. Mm -hmm. For such a time as this, uh, obviously, we have been placed for such a time as this in this culture, in this generation, and even you and I as non-Americans uh, living in America. And I do apologize for having said you were British when you are Irish. I do apologize about That's that. Right. <laughs> Ireland's so, always been very closely linked to France. <laughs> say that again? The Irish have always felt a close link to the mm -hmm. French. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so Oz, it's, I, I'm, I am just uh, very frustrated that I feel we've only touched on some of the highlights of 
the message that you are sharing and we can have many more conversations. I think the best thing that we can recommend to our audience right now is to grab a copy of the Magna Carta of Humanity. Actually, as we are wrapping up, two quick things. We are going to do a book giveaway. And so you will need to go to gospelspice.com slash giveaway and enter for a chance to win a copy of Oz's book, The Magna Carta of Humanity. And as we are wrapping up, Oz, can you tell us why you called your book The Magna Carta of Humanity specifically? In just a minute, to sum things up, why is Exodus The Magna Carta of Humanity? Well, the Magna Carta is the greatest symbol of a stand against the abuse of power on behalf of freedom in the English-speaking world. But I think far, far beyond that, Exodus and the biblical understanding of freedom is truly the Magna Carta, not just of the English-speaking world, that's far too small, the Magna Carta of humanity. And that's why we as followers of Jesus it's good news. It's the best news ever to tell to our generation. Mm -hmm. Yes. I had the privilege of seeing one of the original copies of the Magna Carta at the Museum of the Bible. I think there's five copies. One of them, unless I'm mistaken, mm -hmm. is there. Uh, and it's falling apart because it's a piece of document that is very old and unlike the scriptures that are not falling apart, that are immortal because they are the word of God. The Magna Carta of uh, England or, you know, the Commonwealth might be falling apart at the seams physically uh, at the Museum of the Bible. But indeed, the scriptures are not falling apart because God, um, God's word is alive and well. So thank you, Oz, so much for joining us today. It is a huge privilege and I hope we'll have you again soon. And by the way, we will have the privilege of welcoming your absolutely incredible wife, Jenny, in an upcoming episode. Uh, she has a phenomenal story and uh, she will be a huge blessing to us as well. So thank you, Oz, for joining us today. No, my privilege and truly she is my better half. So you will enjoy having her on. Can't wait. Thank you so much. And now, a brief message from Gospel Spice. At Gospel Spice, you often hear us say, hey, play and pray Gospel Spice forward. Well, I'm here to tell you how to play Gospel Spice forward. You can share a podcast with your friends and loved ones. If you're listening to an episode and it really touches you and you think of a friend or a loved one, simply text them and share our episode with them and let them know, I was thinking of you when I heard this. I think it's going to bless you. It's just that simple. Now, another way to play it forward is to leave us a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. Help us with that algorithm thing so that others can find Gospel Spice. Thank you. Now, back to the video. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Merci. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon so you are the first to know when we release a new video or episode. Also, would you please consider helping us reach new people with the good news of the spice of the gospel by leaving a five-star review for the Gospel Spice podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Google, etc. Finally, share and follow us on social media to spread the word of Gospel Spice. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to tune in our podcast with new episodes every Friday. I'll see you in our next video very soon right here. Merci.